Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Bowles. I work for Autodesk. I'm the BIM 360 Territory Manager for uh, EMEA. Essentially what that means is that I have commercial responsibility for two cloud-based products within the Autodesk family. Uh, I suspect you would have heard of them, whether you've had a chance to play with them or, or use them uh, is another matter. But uh, the two tools I look after are BIM 360 Field and BIM 360 Glue. Uh, and today I'm going to be concentrating uh, the talk on BIM 360 Field, but in the Genius Bar later, if anyone wants to talk to me about BIM 360 Glue, uh, which has been sort of coined as Navis Works in the Cloud, uh, used as a design collaboration and coordination tool, then uh, come up and speak to me uh, a bit later today. But the focus for the next 15 minutes is going to be BIM 360 Field, and it's, it's actually very nice to be presenting back at CETA. I think the last time I was here was probably about eight, nine years ago when I was presenting a project collaboration technology. Uh, it's, been, it's been really nice over the last <coughs> nine, ten years to see how the use of technology in, in Ireland has evolved from you know, patting ourselves on the back for, for sharing documents on a project extranet like four projects or BC or A site or, or whatever it might be, Buzzsaw. Uh, and then we progressed into you know, configuring the common data environment to BS 1192 standards. Uh, and now we're seeing the emergence of things like PASS 1192 and, and the sharing of uh, model information uh, and how we've moved from maybe a document centric way of working into a, in, into a data-centric uh, environment that Andrew touched on earlier. So it's, it's been fascinating to watch that and now we're seeing uh, a number of trends in the industry. So Autodesk, we're seeing the marriage or convergence of three factors right now that uh, are almost creating a perfect uh, storm, uh, excuse the pun, for this next generation of, of, of BIM in the cloud. And I'll try and demystify some of that for you uh, over the next 15 minutes. So the first factor we're seeing, uh, certainly an increased BIM adoption that's been spoken about uh, a lot this morning uh, and last night by the sound of things. Uh, and whether that BIM adoption or increased BIM adoption is being driven by public sector mandates like we're seeing in the UK government and, and further afield with, with other global uh, mandates or whether it's being driven by BIM savvy private sector clients, uh, it, it's here to say as Mark was saying, uh, it's not going anywhere. Second factor we're seeing in the market is increased demand for access to information on mobile devices like the iPad. Uh, Andrew flashed up a few slides of BIM 360 field earlier. Uh, I'll show you that in a live software demonstration uh, very shortly. But people wanting to work remotely uh, with or without an internet connection out in the field, wanting to capture information in real time, perhaps feed that back into the model uh, and drive efficiencies. Uh, uh, I think Andrew put it very nicely actually. It was either, I think you said, uh, do more with the same resource or reduce the number of resources. So it's either an FTE saving or it's, you know, giving people more time to do uh, value-added work rather than onerous administration stuff. The third factor we're seeing is the increased adoption of cloud computing. Uh, for some of you, uh, that might scare the life out of you. For some of you, you, you've just embraced it and you recognise the benefits of putting your IT in the cloud uh, and leveraging the elasticity of the cloud or the infinite computing power of the cloud as opposed to tying up local resources on the desktop. Uh, and if you want to discuss that uh, in more detail and what that means for your for your IT infrastructure, then uh, we can talk about that a bit later. So we're seeing that the marriage of those three factors, creating an environment that allows our clients now to plan, design, simulate, visualise, document and, and, and build better. Okay. Uh, I think this statistic was shared by Andrew in his earlier slide is that, ironically, whilst 70% of, or 75% of construction cost occurs in the field, uh, there's a huge disconnect between how much money is spent uh, mobilising the mobile workforce in terms of IT spend on mobile devices. It's, it's kind of ironic that I order something from, from Amazon that costs five pounds and, and the guy gives me a PDA and I sign it, yet yeah, on, a, on a multi-billion pound scheme that, that the thought of using mobile technology is, is, uh, you know, scares, scares a few people. So the emergence of tools like BIM 360 Field is really to redress that balance and, and that huge disconnect between where the risk and the money is spent, i.e. in the field, uh, and making sure that the IT spend uh, aligns itself to that. You know, we spend a lot of money on the ERP systems, project planning software, design applications, yet the risk and the money spent in the field, uh, people are still a little bit nervous about putting mobile technology uh, out there to de-risk those projects. So some of you will have heard of Vela Systems. Uh, Vela Systems was the original name for BIM 360 Field. Autodesk had some, some seed money in that company uh, over the last two or three years and then acquired the technology in June 2012 uh, and rebadged it as BIM 360 Field, but their mantra from the very start, they were a Boston-based software company started in 2005, uh, and they set out to revolutionise the construction industry uh, in terms of how data is captured in the field, but also more importantly how that data is then used uh, from a reporting mechanism uh, to give a view as, uh, as to how projects were performing. 
So BIM 360 field, whilst it's quite an interesting point, my colleague reminded me to, uh, to mention this, is that whilst it's got BIM in the name, it's kind of misleading because BIM 360 field can be used on non-BIM projects. Uh, what we're finding in the UK and, and the rest of Europe is that people are sort of dipping their toe in the water with BIM 360 field and they're using the quality assurance or quality control checklist or the snagging features of BIM 360 field on non-BIM projects, but they know that their investment in BIM 360 field is future-proof from an extent as, their BIM mature, as they move up the BIM maturity curve and more of their projects become BIM enabled. So they, they like the fact that they can use BIM 360 field on non-BIM projects, but then if they do have a BIM project, they can then leverage the power of being able to take the model to site. They can use uh, the power of being able to commission equipment on site and then bidirectionally feed that back into the model. Or as Andrew was saying earlier, integrate that data seamlessly into a, into a CAFM system, be it Maximo, Dome, uh, FSI, whatever it might be. So these four blocks on here represent the sort of four functional areas of BIM 360 field. Uh, the first three are pretty much non-BIM uh, pieces of functionality. Um, Mark, you were talking about QAQC earlier. Uh, Andrew, you, you showed a hard copy pro forma you then digitised and made into a, an electronic form. The whole process of taking information or capturing information in the field on pen and paper dates back many years, but it's inherently very time inefficient. It's amazing how many people still do it. They walk out with a pen and paper, fill in information, maybe an inspection test plan, uh, QAQC check of some description. Then they walk back to the site office only then to have to rekey it into an Excel <laughs> spreadsheet or a, or a database and then disseminate that information. Uh, I know, Andrew, on, on some of your projects, you were seeing field efficiency gains of between 20 and 70 percent, moving from traditional, onerous, time inefficient paper based processes to then capturing that information electronically. So that's what the first element is, and I'd wrap safety into that as well. So doing safety walks electronically as opposed to on pen and paper. Uh, documents to the field, this isn't an extra net, this isn't like a bus saw or, a, or an ACE site or a conject or, or anything like that. This is about providing 2D documents uh, to the field-based workers just by navigating through a traditional hierarchy and finding documents in folders. Um, but then the kind of game changer for BIM 360 field compared to sort of point solutions that address maybe just QAQC or health and safety or just documents to the field or just snagging is this future-proofing element of being able to smooth, uh, sort of speed up the equipment commissioning and handover phase. So Andrew showed a slide of a truckload of paperwork being delivered on site. The time to collate that information is huge, can run into months, whereas the idea here is that our clients are looking to streamline that whole process, uh, capture asset information at the point of commissioning, feed that back into the model, and either hand that model over as a, a digital deliverable to the end client, or as Andrew said, potentially integrate that with a CAFM system. And that whole process is now shrinking from weeks, uh, sorry, months even, down to a uh, low order of weeks. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, I'm actually going to show you some of this live on the iPad with no safety net. It's pretty dangerous, arguably stupid. So here I have a ruggedized iPad. Andrew, you made reference to iPads getting damaged in the field potentially, and that there is some nervousness about taking these expensive devices out in the field. What I would say is that some companies are now adopting the policy that if you look after your iPad, uh, after two years it becomes your own device, and we've, we've, we've noticed hardly any iPads going missing or any <laughs> iPads getting damaged since that, that rule was put in place, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's quite a good one. So what I've got here is BIM 360 Field. Uh, it's a combination of an iPad app, <coughs> Uh, for capturing information in the field, but also it's a web application to do your management reporting. So I'll show you both aspects, the, the web interface and also the iPad. The iPad's available uh, from the App Store. You need a subscription. And come talk to me about the commercial arrangements a bit later if, if you're interested. But essentially I log in using a username and password. That governs what access I have to the software. Um, I can be a member of any number of projects, so a bit like an extranet, you have to be explicitly invited into a collaboration space in order to see it, and then through access permissions we grant you access to the various uh, granular levels of functionality that's available, uh, depending on your role. So on the left -hand, start, uh, left hand side, we'll start off very gently just with some snagging, some QAQC stuff, all the things you, you'd be able to do in a, in a non-BIM project, and then we'll progress gently into the, into the 3D world. So let's just start off very quickly by talking about snags or issues. Okay, so in this area, uh, this could be a vertical building project, so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to navigate into a particular location within this vertical building, and I'm going to create a snag in this area. So I'm just going to say there's some damage to a window frame, and I can use the iPad's camera to take a photo of the snag, excuse me. Okay, so what that's done now is it, it's, it's inextricably attached that 
photo to this snag, and then I can use red lining tools uh, to mark up the problem. So I don't need to carry a digital camera around on site, everything is built into, into the iPad. So that's now attached uh, to that particular issue, and now I can assign that to a, a trade contractor, uh, I can give it a priority, and any user-defined fields that I want to put in against that snag. So we can create our own content and our own forms that we want to capture. Uh, and then I can put a, a push pin into a 2D plan, for example. Now, a bit later I'll show you how you can put a push pin into a 3D model as well, which is pretty innovative. Uh, but this just allows me to say, you know, that snag to that damaged window was, was found over there. And obviously all of this stuff falls out in, in, in the reports. So that's just capturing a simple snag. And when I sync the iPad, so down here we've got this yellow balloon. This indicates that something's happened in the field that we then need to sync back to the central database. You'll notice in the top left-hand corner, I'm in uh, flight mode, so I have no internet connection. But the app will work underground, it will work anywhere, because it's not reliant on an internet connection. Uh, and as you guys know, trying to put you know, persistent internet connectivity across your site, especially if you're working on a geographically sped civil job, it's, it's nigh on impossible or cost prohibitive. So the idea is that you sync your iPad before you go out into the field, you work locally offline, capture the information, and when you have a persistent or a, or a reliable internet connection, you feed the data back into, into the database. And that will send off notifications, populate reports, depending on what, uh, what rules you've set up. Just moving quickly on to checklists, so QAQC, uh, health and safety, and potentially commissioning. And the beauty here is that you populate this with your own content. So none of this is hard-coded. You take the standard hard copy pro formers, of which Andrew showed an example earlier, and you copy and paste the content into one of our spreadsheets, and you just whack it into the system. Uh, that's a technical term. Uh, and then what you do is you build up a standard library of standard operating procedures that you want to use in the field. So if Andrew wanted to mobilize another project, maybe in a different region, you know, his use of BIM 360 field at the moment is within the northeast region of, of, of BAM. If, for example, London wanted to make use of those same QAQC procedures, and it makes sense to standardize across the company on, on health and safety and QAQC, that project can just cherry pick those, uh, those checklists that have already been uh, configured for that particular company. So if I just go into, say, something like a pre or concrete inspection or something like this. This is what a typical form looks like. Andrew flashed one up earlier. But essentially, it's just selfie, uh, self-evident, stupid easy. You just put plus, minus, and you configure these forms with your own content. Um, if I show a, a health and safety one here, you'll notice that when I find a non-conformance on site, it creates me an issue on the left-hand side. So what clients are using this for is for doing root cause analysis on accidents. So they're trying to drive down their accident incident rate in order to do that, they need to understand the root cause of why near misses are happening on site or health and safety issues are happening on site. It's very worrying in our industry that we've had more deaths this year, I think, than, than previous years. So this stuff still needs to get uh, addressed. We can hang help and guidance notes, uh, notes off each of these checklist items. Uh, one of my clients is doing this uh, rigorously for all of the checklist items because a lot of knowledge is leaving the business as people retire. A lot of that tacit knowledge that's captured in people's head is also leaving the business. So what they're doing against the checklist items, they're putting in help and guidance notes from those people that have been working in the field for years. You know, what does a good concrete pour look like? What does a good weld look like? What, does, you know, what are the PPE guidelines? Whatever it might be, just chucking that information against each of the, uh, the checklist items. And then we also support electronic signatures as well. So uh, here... You know, we're doing a, an inspection on a pile or something, we can still capture that as if we were doing that uh, using pen and paper. Okay, conscious of time. So let's move on to equipment. So this is the sort of the game changer, as I like to call it, because snagging solutions have been around for years. You guys will have heard of tools like Priority One and SnagR and Snagit and, and all these tools. And, and, and none of those tools are bad tools. However, they are primarily driven to support snagging towards the back end of a job. Whereas what we're trying to do with BIM 360 Field is have a more progressive capture of issues throughout the project life cycle. So at the end of a job, you don't have this surge in observations and surge in costly rework. You, you smooth that out over time, so you stand a better chance of hitting your project end, uh, end date. What I'm showing you here is a list of equipment that's been downloaded from a Navisworks model, or a Revit model, I should say. So being an Autodesk product, uh, you'd expect it to have some integration with other Autodesk products. So this equipment list hasn't been populated just manually, it's been taken down from a Navisworks model or a Revit model. And, and the reason we're doing that is that we can then go out, barcode or QR code attach to all of our HVAC or individual components within the model, put barcodes on these things, use the iPad reader to go to a, you know, use the barcode scanner, scan something, 
that will then hyperlink straight to the piece of equipment, say this particular pump, and then we can capture all the asset information that we want to, to feed back into the model. So what Andrew's done, he's taken user-defined fields that they want to capture in the field, things like its serial number, has it got warranty, attachments to O&M manuals, all of this sort of stuff at the point of commissioning, rather than having to retrospectively capture all of that information and create a huge bottleneck and a time lag at, uh, at the end of the job. So in here, I can you know, merrily say this is now installed, okay, and all of this information will get fed back into the model. And we can do clever things like use the appearance profiler in Navisworks to turn piece of equipment a different colour based on their status in the field. So we've got some very clever clients that are using this to track prefabricated parts from the factory being delivered on site. So for example, unitized curtain walling that wraps around a building, you can say once it's installed on site, turn it green in the model. And that's either being used by the contractor as a means of demonstrating that they've done work and get, can get paid sooner, or it's just a means of value-add service to the client, so they can almost see a 4D simulation of the progress of their, their job on site without having to visit site. So you fill in all this information, you choose what information you want to push back to the model, but then of course you can then show that, you can take the model out into the field. So this is the, that model, this is that component, and then we have various things we can do in here. We haven't got time to show it, but you know, we can isolate things in the model, we can look at its attributes, we've got measuring tools, we can bring different viewpoints. So you're taking the model out into the field now. Uh, and what you're also able to do is um, you're able to put push pins in the model as well. So I could put, I could put a push pin into that particular model and say this is, a, this is an issue against that piece of equipment and we can report on all of that good stuff. So once I've synced that, all of that information goes back to the web interface. Uh, Tom, can I have a quick time check? Two minutes? Sorry, Tom. You're just on time, yeah? Just a what, couple of minutes? One. One minute. <laughs> you drive a hard bargain, Tom. Okay. Let's have a quick look in here. So in the one minute I have, the, in the 45 seconds I've got remaining, I just want to show you a couple of things. Firstly, Navis works. So I told you I downloaded the equipment records from Navis. Now let's pretend we've synced our iPad and we're pushing that back into the model. I can now go into Navis works where I have mapped this model to BIM 360 <coughs> field. And as I mentioned, I can use the, the appearance profile. So you'll notice I've created a rule that says if the status of BIM 360 field against this equipment record equals install, turn it green. And I can then run that and then that will turn that pump green because in the field someone has marked that as not delivered, it's now installed. So we've got that capability. Then we also have the capability to view all of this information from a web reporting point of view. This is the same screen that, that Andrew showed in his presentation. And depending and contextual to your role, you can bring up different portlets of information such as number of snags created versus closed out, what's the equipment progress tracker like, uh, oldest unresolved issues, time you know, KPI metrics on how trades are responding to tasks. So you've got all of that good stuff. And then just finally, if I could just summarise the value proposition for you. Uh, you know, we've, we're seeing clients now achieving nine hours per user per week in cost savings, uh, in time savings, sorry. Now when you add that up across all the people that are out in the field, that is, that's huge. You know, the return investment argument stacks up big time for this sort of stuff. The value proposition, what our clients are telling us that they are Whilst there may be different views on whether BIM can be used as a competitive advantage, we're seeing people putting the use of BIM 360 field and, and, and tools like it as, as a means of differentiating themselves in bids, okay, almost like a value-add service. Uh, we're seeing improved profitability because we're not having to do costly rework because we've done snagging just at the back end of a job and increased the number of observations towards the end. Uh, and we're also seeing people driving down accident incident rates and being able to impose or enforce the use of quality management protocols and health and safety guidelines uh, in the field. So that's a very quick whistle-stop tour of BIM 360 field. As I said, I'll be in the Genius Bar a bit later with my colleague Mike. I can just put your hand up, come over and speak to myself or Mike. Uh, but I shall leave it there. Thank you.